Forgive them, Father, for they know not what they do. The Gospel of Luke, the only gospel where this first, last word of Jesus appears, positions it amidst an act of injustice. When they came to the place called the Skull, they crucified him and the criminals there, one on his right and the other on his left. Then Jesus said, Forgive them, Father, for they know not what they do. A good man is executed in the midst of bad guys, thieves, malefactors, lawbreakers. What soul-crushing injustice is Mary, Mary's beloved son being subjected to? Who is to blame for this? Luke captures this moment, a moment of staggering unfairness, of human cruelty of the highest degree, the death of an innocent, the death of goodness, the death of love in the world. A moment every mortal knows in the nucleus of the atoms of their being would be a moment when instinct triggers them to turn with rage and demand answers from a seemingly just God. Instead, Jesus says, forgive them, Father, for they know not what they do. For Jesus is the ultimate lawbreaker, the breaker of the laws of human nature, revealing a new way to be human. Through Jesus, God knows the nucleus of the atoms of our being intimately. God knows the daily struggle between our animal nature and our divine heritage. God knows this through Jesus, and it is through Jesus, even in these final hours, or perhaps especially in these final hours, we are given the gifts of these last words, words to meditate on and reflect, to pray and invite into our lives, <clears throat> words to try out, in our own mouths, in during moments of ultimate crisis. Forgive them, Father, for they know not what they do. Last Saturday, we came to the end of a historic Lent, a Lent that was not a mere practice, not one where we freely cho chose to deny ourselves little luxuries and gratuitous pleasures, mindfully refraining from proclaiming Alleluia but instead were denied the weekly sustenance of tasting holy food and drink, denied the assurance and comfort of an embrace, denied the pleasure of gathering together with those we love or those we might love if given the chance. A Lent where my casual attempt at praying all four services of the daily office quickly became the four pillars holding my day together, the guardian of my sanity, keeping my attention daily directed towards God through this crisis. Lord God, you've brought us in safety to this new day. I lift my eyes to the hills. From where is my help to come? Darkness is not dark to you, O Lord. The night is as bright as the day. Keep watch, dear Lord, for those who work or watch or weep this night. If we learn nothing else from the passion of Jesus Christ, it is that there are unexpected gifts in the suffering comfort in the hardship, bounty in the deprivation. For there is always mercy and always grace and love, always. Instead of trying to carry on the daily office alone, suddenly there were options available from all over the country, including the gift of meeting with fellow parishioners on Zoom at noon. Through the blessing of a decent internet connection, I had never had to pray alone this Lent. The most precious gift of these new days is being quarantined with the love of my life, the woman I vowed everything to, the gift manifested in the rare opportunity to tangibly reap the bounty that the hard-won lessons of our 24 and a half years together have taught us about the power of two, the boundlessness of true love, and the sacrament of marriage. Forgive them, Father, for they know not what they do. And now, when the shadow of death seems so very near to cloaking our nation in impenetrable darkness, an injustice that thousands of deaths might have been prevented pricks daily at our civic consciousness, when the unfairness that even still, even now, selfishness, self-interest, and blame seem to rule the day. Forgive them, Father, for they know not what they do. Forgive them, Father, for they know not what they do. Forgive us, God, for we know not what we do. Amen. And he said to him, Truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Luke 23, verse 43. 
These words were spoken by Jesus to one of the criminals crucified next to him. This was in response to the criminals saying to Jesus, Remember me when you come in to your kingdom. I am going to repeat Jesus' response with a change in punctuation. Truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Or is it, truly I say to you today, you will be with me in paradise. Whichever response it is, there is still that promise of being with Jesus in paradise. The word paradise means an idyllic place or state. It is, it is a word that I can imagine most of us have in mind in these tumultuous uncertain times. In this period of shelter in place, we can see paradise as a personal physical space where we feel safe and comfortable. Or as part of our imagination, a vacation spot we always envisioned but never had the chance to visit. Or a vacation spent in a destination we felt was truly paradise. Or for some of us, an island, a place of our birth where we feel is like a paradise. Whichever one of these we use is still a means of escape from this emotionally charged, stressed atmosphere. During the current pandemic that is, that is affecting everyone, I am sure that all of us are using at least one of these escape routes to alleviate our anxiety. On a personal note, I am using all of them. When Jesus spoke these words to the criminal on the cross, they were words of assurance, assuring the criminal that in response to his request, he will be remembered because he will be with Jesus in paradise. Jesus' paradise is what God promises us all. God's paradise is his everlasting love. His assurance that we can look to him to satisfy our every need. He sent his only son Jesus to die on a cross for our sins. To be crucified along with two criminals, one who felt that he was deserving of his punishment. Who wanted Jesus to remember him when Jesus came into his kingdom. So we can infer that Jesus' kingdom is paradise. God is a forgiven God. He is in our lives and is a virtual paradise, a paradise that can only come from God. During this time of uncertainty, turmoil, and anxiety, we can have a piece of paradise. We can pray, read and study God's word, the Bible, praising him in song. We can include others in our trip to paradise. Call friends near and far, Reconnect with those you haven't heard or seen recently. A simple text to say, I am thinking of you. Praying for those who are sick and or hospi hospitalized. Praying for the families who have lost loved ones. I encourage you to visit a paradise that Jesus talked about, God's presence. His pure, unconditional, forgiving love. No monetary exchange needed, no bartering. Remember to share that paradise with those around you near and far. Woman, behold your son. Behold your mother. The words of a dying son to his mother. How tender as they gaze upon each other. I think about this scenario by calling to mind a few prior significant moments between Jesus and his mother, beginning with the moment of his birth. The Gospel writer describes how Mary wrapped her firstborn son and laid him in a manger. I get a sense of her tenderness. At the age of 12, Jesus and his family traveled to Jerusalem for Passover. On the return journey, 
Jesus stays behind. He is eventually sought after and found. Mary says, Behold, your father and I have been looking for you anxiously. Mary's loving concern. And the third scenario that comes to mind is the moment of Jesus' first miracle, changing water into wine. Here again, Jesus and his mother. Then the miracle happens. Most likely, you're familiar with these stories. You may be wondering, what does all this replay have to do with the words I'm reflecting on? Well, for me, and I hope for you, it brings context to today's Good Friday story. The replay helps me to imagine how Jesus and his mother built their relationship over the years that you and I are told Jesus lived. And I fill in the gaps by thinking in very human terms of how you and I build our relationships with loved ones, especially in this current and challenging time. Highlighting Jesus and his mother, I'm led to wonder such things as, how did Mary care for Jesus as a boy and as he grew? During Jesus' ministry, did they share details about the miraculous things he did? And how did Mary respond to the difficult encounters Jesus faced with the authorities, with the religious leaders, with rejection, and so forth? But the pondering that stands out for me most of all comes through the words of a well-loved Christmas carol. Did Mary ever think that the birth of her son on that silent, holy night would ultimately lead to such a ghastly event on that particular Friday we now call Good Friday? Woman, behold your son. Jesus says to his grieving mother, then he commits her to the care of another beloved. Behold. Gaze upon is another term for behold. What a moment that must have been. I recall having experiences of being with someone when he or she was actively dying. And quite recently too, during the chaplaincy program I was doing. For me, it's a moment like no other and unique each time. And then it's over. Amidst the sadness, I feel gratitude, if one may call it so, for being able to behold or gaze upon that departed soul. In reflecting on this meditation, my sadness is amplified and I'm praying, so is my faith. I'm thinking of the pandemic and all the departed and departing souls. And I think of their loved ones who cannot behold or gaze upon them. And I pray, Lord, the numbers are beyond my ability to conceptualize. But dear Lord, you can, by your grace and in your mercy, may you behold each soul and grant to them eternal rest. Amen. Eli, Eli, Lamas Bactani, my God, my God. Why have you forsaken me? On this Good Friday, I hear of a crucified Jesus who offers words of forgiveness, of salvation, of relationship, of wholeness and reunion. 
And then there are these as fourth words. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? In the other words attributed to Jesus on the cross, he addresses his father, his Abba. But it's not his Abba, his Papa, that he addresses here. In this cry, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He seems to be calling out to a distant God, a God whose silence is deeply felt in this, Jesus' time of agony. It's been for me now a full month of sheltering in place, quarantine. A month ago I was told to begin work re working remotely from home and not return to my workplace. We were in the middle of a pandemic and only essential workers could leave home. At first I shrugged off this news as a light matter that will resolve itself soon enough. I was quickly corrected. Our governor, Andrew Cuomo, announced the seriousness of the situation. I realized I would be confined to my hermit-like apartment for several weeks, if not months. Once reality hit, I decided I would have to make a daily schedule if I hoped to keep sane. I decided to start and end each day with time set aside for quiet prayer. Since my confinement, I hear ambulance sirens going all day and all night. In recent days, the sirens have grown in frequency. Instead of a steady stream of sirens throughout the day, I now hear two, three, and sometimes four or five ambulances all at once. Again, all through the day and all through the night. This past weekend, after weeks of being cooped up, I took a walk. As I walked by the hospital across from our church, I heard a clunk. I turned and saw not one, but two trailer trucks. I noticed the grim-faced men by the trucks. I may have heard a body going in. Earlier this week, as I sat in prayer for meditation, I found myself wanting desperately to escape the constant sirens. Sirens, you may notice, sound like calls of distress. It's hard to hear it and not want to act in some way. Someone told me to remember that what I was really hearing was the sound of people rushing to help other people. When this period passes, I'm sure we'll hear the stories of first responders and others who performed great feats of mercy and compassion. As I sat in prayer, I also heard the birds. I noticed that the birds' trills sometimes match the siren's staccato alarms and vice versa. My body received the sounds of the birds quite easily and joyfully. And then the sirens would intrude, and I felt like escaping my body running away. I wondered why I was able to welcome the birds, but not the sirens. So I started saying to the sirens, welcome, welcome, you are welcomed. This took some effort, but after an hour, I was welcoming the birds and the sirens equally. Welcome, welcome. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? These are the beginning words of Psalm 22. Jesus and his mother likely would have known the words of this song by heart. It may even have been sung to him as a baby. This psalm, like many of the others, starts off with this cry of feeling forsaken and alone. Further in, it also says, you brought me out of the womb. You made me trust in you. Do not be far from me, for trouble is near. No doubt about it. We're living in a strange and confusing time. Just looking at the news, I feel reason to despair. But then, I only heard the birds, like really heard them, amidst the sirens. Faith is like this. 
In my life, I've noticed that faith is most deeply realized when there's been some earlier doubt. It's doubt that activates the faith, that makes the faith most alive. And from there, I'm able to engage life fully with courage and in love. I'm sitting right here in the middle of great suffering, disease, death, and yes, constant wailing sirens. And in the middle of all that exists too, faith, charity, and love. I already hear people of faith making plans for what they hope to do once on the other side of this period of pandemic and quarantine. I hear people of faith sharing their vision for recreating a world based on truth, courage, and love based on the incontrovertible fact of our interdependence. In recognizing our vulnerability and weaknesses as human beings, we simultaneously recognize our strength and our connection. It is in the darkness that we can see the light. I thirst. I would like to begin my meditation by reading a poem by Jorge Luis Borges. This is Luke 23. Gentile or Jew, or simply a man whose face has been lost in time, we shall not save the silent letters of his name from oblivion. What could he know of forgiveness, a thief whom Judea nailed to a cross? For us, those days are lost. During his last undertaking, death by crucifixion, he learned from the taunts of the crowd that the man who was dying beside him was God. And blindly he said, Remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. And from the terrible cross, the unimaginable voice, which one day will judge us all, promised him paradise. Nothing more was said between them before the end came, but history will not let the memory of their last afternoon die. O oh, friends, the innocence of this friend of Jesus, the simplicity which made him, from the disgrace of punishment, ask for and be granted paradise, was what drove him time and again to sin and to bloody crime. I love this poem because I think it's about all of us. All of us are utterly unworthy of the gift of grace God has imparted to us. The thief is, for me, the first Christian, He's the first person to ask for and be granted grace from the crucified Christ. His faith alone is what saves him, because as is clear in both the poem and the gospel reading, his actions alone leave him condemned. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Me, and you, and the thief. The passage I've been asked to reflect on is the simple sentence, I thirst. It is spoken by Jesus as he's dying on the cross, and in response he is given a sponge soaked in vinegar. Jesus thirsts, and his thirst is mocked. The irony of this moment couldn't have been lost on the Gospel writer. Here, the living water himself is thirsty. It's the clearest example I can think of of Christ's humanity. He is very human and very God, but in this moment he seems more human than divine. If Jesus thirsted on the cross, we must assume that the thief thirsted also. And if we follow the poem, we hear that the thief in some ways thirsted all his life. The same desire for more that made him a thief made him a Christian. Borges calls to attention the thief's simplicity. It is simplicity that made the thief see a loaf of bread or an apple and simply take it, not thinking of what it cost or what he could pay. Similarly, as he's dying on the cross, he recognizes his need for salvation and simply asks for it. We get the sense in this poem of a thief who is driven to theft because the world he has been given is not good enough, not satisfying enough, not enough enough. There is a radical wrongness in the world, and the thief has spent his life trying to rectify it. A further wrinkle is added to the story when we learn that the word translated as thief was the word the Roman authorities used to condemn revolutionaries. Jesus lived in a revolutionary era, and only a generation after his death, this revolutionary fervent would boil over in one of the most spectacular acts of resistance the Roman Empire ever faced. 
the Jewish Roman War of 66 AD. How does it change our reading of the passage if we imagine this friend of Jesus not as a petty pickpocket, but as a revolutionary, a sort of Palestinian Che Guevara? Not much, I think. Revolutionaries are also motivated by the conviction that the present world is simply not good enough and that radical action must be taken to make it right. They hope to leap, leap from the current unjust order to an order of justice. They aren't willing to wait for the slow mechanisms of history to work themselves out. Who's ever answered the question, and when do we want it, with, whenever's good for you? Revolutionaries thirst too. I think we all thirst to a greater and lesser degree. We thirst for a release of the captives, food for the hungry, medicine for the sick, care for the widow and orphan, and justice for the oppressed. When Jesus says, I thirst, he's affirming the validity of these earthly needs, needs that cry out for salvation right now. Of course, in heaven we will have all the water we need, if such a sentence even makes sense. But we are thirsty now, and we need water, whether we deserve it or not. Hi, everybody. So the last words of Jesus that I was uh, given to talk to you about are from the Gospel of John, and it's when Jesus says, it is finished. They come from chapter 19 of uh, John's Gospel. Jesus is on the cross, and there is some sour wine nearby. And verse 30 says, so when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. Uh, John's Gospel doesn't specify exactly what it is when Jesus says it is finished. And I'm sure there are a number of different ways to uh, think about what it could possibly mean. Uh, but in the interest of time, uh, I'm going to talk about only one. And that is um, it referring to uh, Jesus's ministry, his work on earth. And there are a number of verses in John's gospel uh, that uh, would support such an interpretation uh, where Jesus refers to his death at the point as the point at which his work is complete. And that actually infuses the words with some uh, dramatic irony because of course, Jesus's ministry didn't end at the point of his death. We've been continuing it as best we can uh, for the last uh, almost 2000 years. But that, um, that, uh, idea and that uh, interpretation of it is finished actually brings us to today's special word <clears throat> and that is the telestai. Uh, the telestai is the original Greek word from John's gospel uh, which has been translated to it is finished and I am comforted by the hope that most of you don't uh, read, write, or speak the original Greek of John's Gospel. So we all don't know if I'm saying that word right. But um, uh, when I read about the word, when I researched it a little bit, uh, I learned that tetelestai uh, was sometimes used in accounting or business transactions that people with receipts and bills and invoices would actually write tetelestai on it, uh, on, the, on the piece of paper to, um, to uh, memorialize or to confirm that the amount had been paid in full. Uh, it could also could just mean um, in other general contexts that the work, whatever it was, had been brought to a successful conclusion. Uh, but the actual translation is maybe not really even the most significant uh, part of this word. And uh, the more significant part actually might be the grammatical tense of the word. And forgive me, um, and please bear me out for being a little bit um, uh, nerdy about this, but the, the tense, the grammatical tense of tetelestai is present perfect. And uh, for people who don't know uh, what present perfect is, um, it, is a verb that describes a state or being, um, a state of being or an action that occurred in the past and uh, continued from the past to the present and it informs and affects the present. So uh, for example, if I said, I have believed 
that's the present perfect tense of to believe. Um, the belief occurred in the past. It continued from the past to the present, and it affects the present. I have believed up to this point, and today I have believed. So um, with that grammatical tense in mind, um, to tell us die could mean that Jesus' work and who he was uh, happened in the past, but it continued from the past to the present, and it affects the present. And if we think about Jesus' words, his, these last words in this way, um, they're not ironic at all. It's actually Jesus recognizing at his death that his ministry and his work will continue on to the ongoing present. Um, and I certainly do appreciate this interpretation, but when I think about it, I also think about what's going on today and what we're all living through, that um, we're certainly living with a lot of stress and even fear of becoming sick uh, or our loved ones becoming sick. Um, we have a new definition of what essential means. We are all um, staying at home and many of us are not working and we're going out so little and we're doing our best to stay as far away from each other as possible. Um, but our days are also filled with all of this remote communication, um, remote learning, uh, remote interaction. And I mean, certainly uh, Andrea, Walt and I um, have our daily video chats with family, weekly video chats with friends. And I know that there will come a point when all of this ends and we're all told to transition back to what our life uh, used to be. Um, and I wonder what will we take from this time, the good and the bad, what will we take from this time, which will now be on our past uh, and how will it inform and affect our present? And um, I've been wondering, about that um, over the past few days. And if you're so inclined, I certainly invite you all to wonder about that. Um, so until I see you all again, I hope you have a very happy and hopeful Easter. Father, into your hands I commit my spirit, St. Luke chapter 23, Verse 46. Recently, I asked a friend what he would like to hear when he goes to church during this time of the onslaught of the coronavirus. He said he would need to be assured and reassured that this situation did not catch God off guard. He would need to understand how the God we serve fits into the current situation. Is God being hands-off, allowing nature to run its course? More than all, has he abandoned us? I'm sure some of you may be experiencing a similar feeling of abandonment. You would not be the first group of people to feel abandoned by God. The Bible has a number of stories of people who felt abandoned by God. We read in the book of Genesis that the children of Israel murmured against God when they felt they were going to be overcome by Pharaoh, when they were hungry, when they were thirsty. Why have you taken us here to die? They complained. Martha met Jesus after her brother had died and asked, Where were you? If you were here, my brother would not have died. In other words, you abandoned us in our time of greatest need. I can't think of a scene that could evoke a greater feeling of abandonment than Jesus hanging on the cross. The nails are piercing his hands. The crown of thorns is pressing into his head. There is no one around to rescue him. 
he is experiencing the most excruciating pain of his life. Nature seemed to have taken over. In the Gospel of Luke, chapter 23, verses 44 and 45, we read that darkness had covered the whole land. The sunlight had failed. What was Jesus' response to this moment of seeming abandonment? He cried out, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Abandoned by God? It doesn't seem here that Jesus felt abandoned. He knew God was there with him on the cross. He didn't believe that these happenings were outside of God's knowledge and control. As he cried out, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit, he was showing his trust in the sovereign God. As we too face these days of isolation, confinement, where everything seems dark, I want to assure you that God is with us. We can submit ourselves to his lordship. We can say like Jesus, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit, my whole life. And we can say it with confidence. With this submission comes security. In God's hands we are secure. We are assured of God's protection. The words of Psalm 91 assure us of this. One commentary suggests that the first six verses of Psalm 91 are the most reassuring biblical statements of God's protection in times of danger. The Revised Standard Version in verse 4 gives the most beautiful imagery of the mother bird guarding her chicks in time of trouble. He will cover you with his pinions and under his wings you will find refuge. When we submit to God, we will experience God's glory. When the children of Israel cried out against the Lord in their feeling of abandonment, Moses cried out to God and God answered and delivered them, parted the Red Sea, gave manna for food and water to quench their thirst. When Martha cried out against Jesus that he had not been there for them, Jesus said, believe and you will see the glory of God and he raised Lazarus from the dead. Today, in the midst of everything, we see God's glory as well. We see it in the innumerable stories we have been hearing of God's glory being manifested through people's lives as we're all reaching out to help and bring comfort where we can. This coming Sunday, we will experience the glory when we celebrate Resurrection Day. It is a day of God's gift of redemption that Jesus' death on the cross brought us. It is a day of hope. It requires one thing of us, however, believing, an act that no religious leader can do for us. No, God has not abandoned us. He is with us. Let's surrender and submit ourselves to him now and for the future. Amen. Mm -hmm.